Janelle Bakirova presents a series of discussions about the place of Kazakh culture in the global world. Meetings with prominent public figures, candid conversations, collisions of opinions, and discussions about the most important things. Hello, dear viewers. Our guest today is Diliara Aydarbekova. I can't help but notice that I get more and more compelled to communicate with people of various professions, not just with the people of art. They always surprise me with their unexpected, fresh and original perception of cultural processes. Diliara Aydarbekova is a philosopher by nature, a great conversationalist who can talk on various topics. She's a welcome guest in my program. I wanted to invite you to my program and have a chat with you for a while now. I've recently learned that you have a journalistic background and that you were a host of many different programs. You know, as time passes, you realize that you're especially interested in someone. You find yourself interested in someone's publications and the person's thoughts are especially touching. So you feel like you want to know more about the author. Well, of course, since we're doing the Focus on Culture program and as someone who's coming from the world of culture and art, in our conversation, I will concentrate on these particular topics. And I truly believe that you're the right person to talk about them. Hopefully. <laughs> You know, as you get older, you tend to look at your life differently and, of course, draw certain conclusions from it. As for me, I really want to understand what place art and culture, in a broad sense, occupy in our lives. Because sometimes it seems that certain people don't need culture at all. They can do just fine without having culture and art in their lives. While, on the other hand, there are so many people who get more and more involved in cultural activities. So, what place does culture take in our life? You know, art is present in my life every single day. I really love painting, architecture and music too. Like many Soviet schoolgirls, I also graduated from a music school. Did you play the piano? Yes, I still play it at home sometimes. To be honest, not as often as I used to before. But I learned to derive a certain pleasure from the process, although I had lost some skills. I can read note sheets as well as I used to, but my muscle memory is still there. Muscle memory. It's amazing. Sometimes you can't even anticipate what your fingers would do next. And this was such a discovery for me. It turns out that my hands still remember the tunes that I learned 20, 30 years ago. And if you read the note sheets, it can only get distracting. Exactly. This is news to me, that I'm talking to a piano. Anne is here. No, I'm not, no. In fact, there are a lot of people who either restore the experiences of their childhood these days or simply learn to play instruments from scratch. It looks like suddenly people start to feel this urge of playing an instrument, singing, composing and drawing. I see this happening more and more these days. Of course, there was a period when there was no time for that, no time for art. I had such a time, too, when I thought that that was it, there would be no more concerts. And the fact that now our people are so drawn to self-expression is just such a joyful fact to me, as it is the best proof that some positive changes are taking place in our society. But you mentioned architecture. Are you familiar with the world's best examples of architecture? No, I wouldn't say that. Best world's examples are probably known to those who specialize in architecture. I am more of a visual connoisseur. I just look at architecture and decide on whether I like it or I don't. I'm interested in urbanism because many of our family's friends are involved in development and they are quite sophisticated in this regard. Well, when my family and I travel somewhere, we try to draw up our travel plans in a way that allows us to see some of the best examples of urban architecture. 
Do you have a preference when it comes to styles, or do you like anything that's beautiful? You know, I think no matter the style, you can appreciate the harmony, the right proportions, and the talent of the person who created it. It's visible in every piece of art. A person who knows how to create, who has this subtle understanding of the world, who can fit architectural proportions into nature, his talent will be visible regardless of the style in which he works. But nevertheless, classic contemporary art, which is closer to you? You know, perhaps contemporary art. For example, I love Art Deco very much. I think I don't like it. No? Although you know what's interesting, I always say that the Metropolitan an opera in New York is an amazing building. Why do I think so? Because, for example, the Sydney Opera House is modern architecture. Modern, yes. And the Metropolitan Opera is Art Deco in its purest form, but at the same time, it's modern. You will go there and see that there is nothing pretentious about it. Nothing is gilded and it looks as if it is timeless. That's the feeling I get. This is an amazing building, and that stunning chandelier which rises in the air right before the performance starts, and it instantly makes you feel immersed into some kind of fabulous state. When I saw it for the first time, I thought, wow, what is it? And then the stage is very high there. It's high, but it doesn't intimidate you, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Yes. That's true. And this is what talent is. Whenever we talk about the Bolshoi Theater and other big concert halls. Classics, as it is. And what fabulous luck to find a creator who is capable of turning a regular building into something eternal to fill it with meaning, so that it allows the art to transmit its ideas through the shape of the building. Classics, I believe, is a kind of academic style, and it seems to burden people with its seriousness. It encourages people to walk quietly, carefully, and wear evening gowns. But the world is changing so rapidly, the time is so intense, that sometimes you want something really ultra-modern. However, it looks like people in Kazakhstan are still afraid of such things, right? We are still big believers in classics. Well, at least our country's decision-makers. You know, the ballet theater is currently being built in Almaty. Yes. Let's see what they will make out of it. It looks quite traditional, doesn't it? And the Choreography Academy looks interesting, too. I don't think it will turn out to be classic. It somehow looks more modern to me. For me, for example, the building of the National Museum in North Sultan looks too bulky. Pretentious. Yes. Although it is modern architecture, Exactly. Of course, things I say, I say from the perspective of everyday observation. Of course, I'm a big fan of the classics myself. Obviously, I love performing in all European halls. But I've seen so many fancy modern halls and I performed there. And you know, inside, there are no embellishments whatsoever. There's no gilding, the buildings are not built in this pseudo-Italian style and the acoustics there are great. I just had this moment. I channeled my inner journalist here. So I wanted to ask you what's important for a musician when it comes to buildings. Acoustics are everything. Last time I performed in a completely new hall in Luxembourg, in the Philharmonic Hall. And you know, even before I stepped into that hall, I realized how amazing it was. Yes, the colors of the interior were nice, it was a great example of modern architecture, but the most important thing was the acoustics. I realized that straight away. After all, the most important thing for me is when performance sounds exactly the way it's supposed to sound. And it's just this unforgettable pleasure when you realize that everything just feels right. But European halls, of course, are chic. Unfortunately, we have very few halls with good acoustics. Our big hall of the conservatory is one of the few halls with relatively good acoustics. You know, I think this is all about accumulated experience. In Europe, which has a very long tradition of classical music, the construction of such concert halls was a necessity. They are well versed when it comes to small details like that. We still need some time to obtain such experience.
I will now say something which might sound a bit indelicate, but to be honest, previously I had this stereotype that all successful people, especially those who are successful in business, are interested only in so-called surface values that they don't care much about spirituality, culture, and education. And you come from a similar family, from a similar social circle. You and your spouse proved to be very successful within the period of independence. Of course, over the past 10 years, my opinion has changed dramatically. But nevertheless, I would like to know more about what's happening in your social circle. How would you assess the changes that are happening to the social circle you belong to? You know, this is a completely natural and normal process. There is this motivation theory you have probably heard about, the Maslow Pyramid. Maslow Pyramid, yes. <laughs> yes, all marketers know this. It's about meeting your basic needs. After you do that, the level of your consciousness, your perception of the world are changing. And once you stop worrying about solving some most pressing issues, you start turning inward and you start noticing all the beautiful things that surround you. I think that Kazakhstani establishment, they have been through this period too. Although, I can tell you that there are people who have never left their cultural bubble. They were developing in several directions simultaneously, and while they were making money, they were also developing their interest in art. They would be the patrons of art, they would buy art objects, and also they would be engaged in collecting art objects. And you know, this is all about the state of mind and all about education too. If a person lacks this educational basis, he cannot make this big leap and suddenly become interested in paintings or something of the kind. This is a fairly gradual process. And also, once you start to learn about art, when you attend classical music concerts, it means that you have free time. Those who launched their businesses 20, 30 years ago, they simply did not have free time at some point. Because in order to build a business, you need to be there 24-7. 24-7. Not a single interpreter will tell you to work eight hours a day to become rich. It takes more time than that. But once the result is achieved, you can turn to the beautiful, to the creative. You can start buying things, collect something, and build your life priorities around other things, not just material benefits. And this is a common thing. Let's look at the Salini cinema. At first, they wanted to turn it into McDonald's, and now, now, it will become a center for contemporary arts. Center for Contemporary Arts. What you just said has a very deep meaning. There is this kind of transformation of consciousness that happens in people. It's a natural process. Of course, it's a natural, evolutionary process of an educated person. And still, the issue of education is very important here. I have always supported the former minister Yerlan Sagadiev, who used to say that learning a language is also a matter of educating, getting into people's heads. And trilingualism offers some tremendous opportunities. You know, my biggest regret is that I hadn't been learning English in my childhood, so that I could speak it now like my mother tongue. After all, English is now a language that allows you to embrace a huge layer of knowledge and accessible to a person who doesn't speak this language. I'm talking about all kinds of literature about scientific research. 95% of information. 95% of the most recent and up-to-date information is published in English. It gives you the opportunity to broaden your horizons, expand your understanding of the world, expand your knowledge in art, in any field, actually. And if you do not have access to this knowledge, that's because those are translated things, and this information has its limits. <laughs>
So please tell me, you say you're very fond of music. So do you manage to attend any cultural events while you're on business trips? For example, I'm not very good at it. I go abroad to perform at concerts and after that, I almost immediately go back home. It just doesn't happen that I attend exhibitions, concerts or operas while on tour. It's been only like a couple of times that I did that and I remembered them for the rest of my life. How many opportunities have you had that you will remember for the rest of your life? You know, I... Metropolitan Opera? Metropolitan Opera, yes. I attended the Little Mermaid Opera there, but it wasn't... Wasn't that impressive? No, it was. Was it Dargomirsky's Opera? No, it was not Dargomirsky. It was not Dvorak too. It was a different production. Hungarian? But it was interesting. Yes, you know more than I do. I honestly don't remember. It was interesting, it was so lively and unusual. I also attended ballet performances at La Scala. Fascinating. Yes, because every time I go on business trips, I always try to attend a performance or two. I have been to the Bolshoi Theatre several times. I also try not to miss our performances. In Nur Sultan or at Abai Opera House? But you know, I never had this moment of... Oh? Yes, I have never been really impressed, I would say. The only time when I was really impressed was in Paris. It was the modern take on Eugene Onegin, a contemporary production. Everyone was chasing each other around the stage and shooting. You were not impressed, were you? I was shocked. I thought... Well, there should be some correspondence with the source material. As for the latest things I watched, I probably liked the musical about the American Treasury Secretary. <laughs> you know, I remembered it because it was an unusual thing. The plot was interesting, and the music was so... Catchy. It was catchy, it was modern, and also the Treasury Secretary was played by an Afro-American actor. <laughs> a musical about the Treasury Secretary, an Afro-American. And there's also Hamilton. It has caused quite a stir. I had a case study about this musical. For three or four years in a row, I attended Harvard Business School for my training program. And one of the cases I had there was about Alexander Hamilton. So why was it so compelling for me? I was surprised that it was impossible to buy tickets for the show for five years. The cost of a ticket at its peak started at $1,000. Wow, what a commercial success! <laughs> It was an amazing commercial success. So we were taught about this case at the Harvard Business School. They said it was a great example of a cultural phenomenon, because it is still on stage, and it is still impossible to get tickets to it, as it is always sold out. But is it worth the money? You know, yes, it is. Because the music, the plot, everything is quite interesting. Everything is somewhat unexpected. Unexpected? Here comes the question I always ask in every single episode of the program. What is the place of Kazakhstan in the world cultural process? You know, considering the recent breakthroughs in the world of culture, the success of Dimash... Please don't say Imanbek, Dimash and Skriptonit. Well, I know Skriptonit, but not the rest. There's no rest. There are no other examples. If we had our own Maria Callas, for instance, it would be a completely different matter. But what about Kazakh traditional folk music? Well, you know, it's a very narrow segment. It's a narrow segment indeed. You and I do not find inspiration in Russian folklore or in Arabic music. We don't sing Sicilian songs. The global culture is a bit different. It's all about trends. And the classics are considered a common world heritage, right? If some opera singer appears here, the one who will conquer the global stage and glorify Kazakhstan, then... Why not? Yes, why not? This will make Kazakhstan famous, but it won't happen just because of our national music. I don't think so. An artist? Artists. Well, you see, we still have not made it out of our borders. I mean, we're not that famous. Our paintings are not being sold at Sotheby's and Christie's, right? No, they're not. Although there were those small exhibitions organized by our patrons in London, 
Specialists from Christie's and Sotheby's visited them. They come to look and then they're gone. Yes, that is exactly what happens. Although, I once talked with one art dealer, who was an investment banker for many years, and then he changed his profession. Was it a Kazakh guy? No, he's from Hong Kong, and he used to say that it's all about business. Making someone a global celebrity is just a matter of technique. Yes. But you see, we're not applying this technique, because we do not see any prospects in doing so. You see, if you are engaged in art, if you cannot do anything except art, you will rely on it. This is what happens in Kazakhstan. Globally speaking, we do not rely on it. When I see what people want to invest in, I see them wanting to develop projects in the oil and gas industry, construction and real estate. This is what lies on the surface, and art is a slightly different layer, probably a layer of a different economic basis, which is not that steady, one that our people do not really know much about. It was a great pleasure to talk to you, Diliara. Thank you very much for this conversation. I hope we will see each other again to discuss some other topics. I think that a lot of pleasant things will be happening in the field of culture soon, so we will definitely have many reasons to talk and rejoice. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you again.